Hi, I'm Denis Villeneuve, director of Dune Part 2, and this is Note on a Scene. This scene is a very, very iconic scene in the novel where Paul Atreides will finally become a Fremen, being fully accepted by the tribe by riding a sandworm for the very first time. Riding sandworm is something that is part of the Fremen tradition, is something that usually Fremen learn at an earlier age. It's a, one of the scenes where I tried as close as possible to the actual dialogue of the novel. You're brave, we all know that. Eh? Be simple, be direct. Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. I like in that, uh, that dialogue the fact that uh, we feel strongly that Stilgar became some kind of surrogate father to Paul, that uh, Stilgar was like uh, part of the, the healing process of Paul. Hey. I'm serious, nothing fancy, or you will shame my teaching. I won't shame you. I understand. Shai Hulu decides today if you become Fremen, or if you die. There's something that I absolutely love about filmmaking is things that you write, but then the actors bring something uh, even uh, better than I, I was expecting, which is I was looking for that kind of warmth, feeling a bit of humor coming from Stilgar, but the way Timothy reacts to the line makes the scene even better for me. And so the way Timothy uh, becomes a straight man, and the way Stilgar introduces the ways of the desert to Paul, there's something about the humor that is conveyed. I thought that Timothy brought some kind of touch of humor that, that I was like really pleased by. <laughs> Chakopsa. <laughs> in part one, we were introduced this to the Fremen language. There was a bit of it at the end of the movie. But in part two, the character Paul Atreides and his mother Jessica immersed themselves in the Fremen culture. It was very important for me that there will be a prominent use of Chakopsa, the Fremen language. And David Peterson, linguist, behind the design of the language in the part one, made a tremendous amount of work to bring uh, this uh, dialogue uh, to the screen. It's a dialogue that is based on what the ints of what we have in the book, but there was a, a, a substantial uh, uh, amount of it that was created for the movie. <laughs> Suela Jakub is an actress that I was very excited to work with. I love actor that feels free in front of the camera, where I feel that there is no limit. Shishakli in the novel is a young man but uh, I wanted to increase femininity in the Fremen tribe. Why? Because Frank Herbert insists in his novel to say that there's an equality between men and women, that the women are as good fighters as men and that the, the, the responsibility in the tribes are uh, equality shared. But the novel, it, it is expressed, but doesn't show that. <laughs> When the first novel came out, Frank Herbert was disappointed the way the book has been perceived. He felt that the reader were thinking that Dune was a celebration of, uh, of Paul Atreides, but uh, and, uh, right the opposite. Uh, his intention were to make a cautionary tale, a warning toward messianic figures. And in order to correct that, uh, this perception of the first book, he wrote another book, Dune Messiah. Like it's almost like a tiny book, like an epilogue, where we understand what Paul really means to Frank Herbert. What I did is that I transformed Shani's character. I made her more prominent. In the book, Shani kind of disappears, dissolves into the shadow of Paul. She's in the background. She's a believer. She's not, there's nothing special apart that she's a, a Paul a, a, a lover. There was a strong opportunity there, a character that could help me to have a distance, a critical distance with Paul Atreides. I love witness people that are listening in corners or that you can just feel their presence without dialogue and understand what they are going through. And Zendaya is incredibly expressive with her eyes. And she brought that strength to the character that was required. I wanted uh, uh, to see and earn the power of the youth and someone that wants to transform her world that she doesn't believe in the old ways of seeing the world 
and she's uh, a free character. Through her eyes, we understand what Paul becomes and in which direction he goes, and which transforms the movie not into a celebration, but as uh, uh, Frank Herbert was wishing, more of a warning. <sighs> the eyes. The prep of part two was much more compressed than a part one because I wanted the movie to come out as quickly as possible. It, it's not a sequel, it's a second part, which so was important for us to bring the movie quickly to the world. Now, saying this, uh, there's a tremendous amount of R&D as we were doing part one. We knew the vocabulary, we knew the, the design, uh, there was something, we were on solid ground. But there's still some uh, technical advancement that were, that were made. And uh, as in part one, the eyes were done end by end, this time the software were, were designed so the AI was like a way to help, help us to uh, bring the level of realism that I want to the eyes of part two are much more precise than uh, the, what was made in part one. <laughs> I'm madly in love with a shot like that. When I was drawing storyboards sometime with Simon Dickey, we were just doing a line with a tiny dot. It's just like there's something about the purity and uh, it's probably linked with my, my childhood where I was raised with an horizon with nothing around, but it's like there's something uh, here about bringing back the human as its right scale in the landscape, like an ant in contact with the immensity, with uh, the meditative impact of the desert uh, that I think is very powerful. Lower. The sound here that uh, uh, it, it has been done is, is I ask uh, Richard King to go back in the desert and to make sure that we will hear that uh, specific sound of the, the hissing of the sand that uh, sounds almost like a strange singing. I was very pleased with the, the sound, the crew that we were able to bring back that, that specific sound that we were hearing all the time in the desert. That is something that happens in the novel. But what happens after is what the movies bring to, to life. Here in the book, it's written that all rides the worm. It's very evasive about how a human being could jump on such a beast. I knew it would be a central scene, probably one of the most important scenes of the movie. And I knew that if this scene was a success, I would have a movie. There's some description, of course, in the book, the maker hooks and the thumper. How precisely to bring that to the screen was like, a, I had to figure that out. And uh, to create a kind of seminar for my crew where I taught them how to ride a sandworm and I explained to them how we will bring that to the screen. When I did so, there was a silence around the table uh, because what I was asking for was like to bring a level of a realism that uh, will require a tremendous amount of time. I wanted to shoot everything on, on the real sunlight that was the key for the VFX. This shot where we see Paul walking, I really love the tension that is brought by a stillness, being in front of a still landscape. There's something here, to be honest, that it, uh, was inspired by Jaws, the idea that what you don't see is more frightening. It's knowing that there's something underneath that might come soon. It's a lesson that I learned a long time ago from Spielberg. So the idea here is it's pretty simple. A Fremen, in order to jump, to ride a worm, will put a thumper at the lower, lower side of the dune, stand on top, and wait for the worm to catch, 
and get like that and, and, and will eventually jump. But of course, it's the first time that Paul is riding a sandworm. So I had to find the right equilibrium, the right balance to show his skills. And in the same time, how difficult it is and how he risks his life. Having been in this desert in part one, I knew that there was those kinds of crater in the, between sand dunes, those kind of vast flat space. And uh, I thought that a Fremen will use that flat space in order to be able to calculate the trajectory of the sand dunes. I was pleased to find the right one with the right sun position because we didn't use any artificial light in the desert shooting uh, part two, like we did in part one. It's like a, it's a, it brings a level of eye realism and, and a feeling of a, a strong tactile sensation that you feel with the nature that I was looking for. Again, I tried to shoot as much as possible on camera, meaning that the VFX would be blended inside the reality of the landscape. What I can say about this moment is how I was absolutely uh, pleased with the sound design. It was important for me that the, the worm will not express itself like some kind of ancient dinosaurs or some kind of monster, but that the sound that it will emulate will be inspired by the friction of such a beast in the, uh, against the rock and the sand. You will feel almost like it's a bending building against the wind or something. The sound of a lake, frozen lake in winter in Canada, where you have like those eerie, incredible singing sound that I feel absolutely surreal. And I wanted to convey that kind of where nature goes in a, in a direction with the sound that is absolutely unpredictable, that feels very grounded in the reality of the image, but feels still as a, there's a, a, a connection with the surreal. Richard King absolutely nailed that. The idea was to convey the idea that Paul missed it. The worm is not exactly where Paul intended it to be. There's like a, a gap between his position and the worm, and that for to increase the fact that he's learning, he's about to miss his Uber, uh, technically. All these shots have been made in the real landscape. I insisted that there will be no uh, CG element here, apart from, of course, the worm. I wanted to create that feeling when you're beside a, a, a waterfall, the relationship that in the subconscious that it brings with death. This first part of the sequence has been shot in the desert in Abu Dhabi. The problem we, we, we were facing is that uh, Greg Fraser and I wanted the worm to come in on the sunny side and get out on the shadow side. Sounds ridiculous, but there's not a lot of sand dunes because of the wind pattern in Abu Dhabi. The abrupt side of the sand dune don't face the right side the, in the right way. So we had to create our own sand dune in order to do that specific shot. There was sand dunes that were created according to the right sunlight. This is real until here, of course. The idea here is that man-made sand dune. And there is, uh, after that, an ex set extension where the worm is getting out. It's by far one of the most difficult shots I've done. The idea to have a stuntman running on a specific sand dune and have a perfect sunlight that will disappear, collapse in the sand dune. So in order to do so, what we did is that we created a, a sand dune where there were like three massive cylinders, giant cylinders. Each cylinder will pull by a truck. And the stunt was running this way. And the idea was to have at the perfect timing, we had to pull those tubes under the sand dune in order to the sand dune to collapse. And the, the stunt needed to be perfectly, to land perfectly at the right spot at the right time. And that we could only shoot early mornings because of the direction of the sunlight. And it sounds easy, but those trucks were massive trucks. And in order to find the proper speed over the course of many days, to in order to arrive at the perfect timing that I was looking for, where we have actually saw a human being running and seeing the world collapsing under his feet, which I think is an absolutely nightmarish uh, event. 
and that I, I was trying to do with uh, as much realism as possible. When the trucks move forward one after the other, and after they were moving in a in a certain order, uh, they were not moving all in the same time, but with a, a split second each, each other, so the collapse was progressive. Once the tube were gone, the, the stuntman was landing on mattress uh, that were hidden uh, under the, the, the sand. That. Quite simple in theory, uh, but it was difficult in practice because I wanted again to shoot that all in, under natural light. I asked my uh, production designer to create a gigantic platform, a reproduction. We tried to build the biggest platform possible with the sandworm skin. This platform will be on a gimbal. It's a machine that allows us to move the platform in uh, uh, one way or the other. The platform can modulate like that at different speed. It's something that is used uh, action sequences in, a, in an airplane or sometimes for a car accidents or things like that. But this time it was like a specific one that could move quite faster. And uh, it, uh, it, it required a lot of engineering from a uh, Gerd Nebzer, which is one of the best in the business uh, regarding uh, special effects. What, the way we did that is that we had like what they call the dog collar and the gimbal was like here. And uh, this was oriented according to sunlight. We were shooting each shot at specific moment of the day when the sun was specifically in the right direction. Each shot needed a specific programming in the platform to convey different moment of the worm ride. That was like a, one of the approach. The other one was on the building of the soundstage, we put the platform at different angles like that when the character is falling. We had also one platform that was like vertical like that with a gimbal that was used for the shot you're seeing here where I wanted the character to lose contact with the platform like as he, if he was the platform was falling in order to do so the platform goes from this to this angle so the character will fall into the worm and it's like a, a game with gravity that I was very excited to do, but that uh, required uh, uh, my crew to work uh, many days in order to find the right speed and, and uh, the right angle. Make sure that the sandworm riding will be as edgy, as real. It will uh, look dangerous, but also uh, some kind of a, a feeling of heroism. And despite his clumsiness, that Paul will succeed. Finally, being one with the desert, that this idea that Fremen have the ability to uh, be in total harmony with the desert, and that it's like a, a human finding the right balance and, and being in one. It's a very important moment in the book and it's a fundamental moment in the movie. When we designed the sandworm skin in part one for Patrice Vermette, my production designer and I, it was important that the sandworm will feel prehistoric, like that uh, all the design of the worm uh, will be in direct relationship with his environment, a bit like uh, the way the novel was, uh, was uh, uh, written that you could explain uh, from this biology how it feeds, how it evolves, how, how it lives under such ar uh, harsh conditions. And, and it's a beast technically that lives, lives under the sand at, at tremendous heat. And, and it's like uh, we try to create the most believable uh, being uh, as possible, still having that kind of godlike quality to it that is so important for the Fremen psyche. In the book, we understand that a Fremen can ride a worm by exposing a sensitive part of its skin. The, the worm has like some scales. Uh, and when you lift one of them, you expose sensitive skin. The worm trying to protect itself 
uh, will uh, stay at the surface. I felt that it was not enough. I needed something to express to the audience that uh, that sense, that vulnerability. I, I come with this idea of Vance, part of this breathing system, that once exposed, uh, uh, you will understand that it's, uh, the, the worm feels vulnerable this way. The platform was surrounded by massive fans. We were throwing an insane amount of dust on the stunts. Tons of uh, dust were used in that sequence in order I wanted really to feel that the character is going through waves of, of uh, sand and disappear into the, the, the dust and to feel that he has to master the elements. The action of, of sand riding uh, uh, involved a lot of uh, violence and danger. One of my favorite moments in the movie where I wanted to bring some, uh, again, heroism, but also a feeling of a sacred moment that uh, from the Fremen perspective, this will be a, a one moment that will fulfill one of the elements of the prophecy where a boy will be able to tame a giant sandworm, one of the, one of the biggest ever seen. A boy from the other world will be able to be in relationship with Chai Ulud. And that I wanted that to be conveyed in the, in the, in the music that feeling that something very special is happening, something almost sacred from the Fremen perspective. In order to convey that speed, the plates were shot with helicopters, but the, the character actually is shot with a long lens and a, a rig that goes at high speed in order to feel that instability on the character as if he was passing by. There's like a, a precise shift where we see that uh, it will go from Paul being celebrated by the Fremen because he succeeded, obviously, but we will see from Shani's perspective, the Fremen will go from celebration to adoration. When I, I, I decided to make this adaptation of the novel, the first artist that I approached to help me to do so was Hans Zimmer. Hans is like me, a massive fan of the novel. Hans, give me a warning, is it, is it a good idea to tackle your childhood dreams? Are we meant to fail? You cannot bring to the screen the full potential of the dream of the teenager. There was a lot of wisdom in that, and that I, I, I kind of, uh, frankly, agree with him. That was the challenge. That was the specificity of, of this project, was to try to go back in time and bring back those images to the surface. And now that both movies are completed, take me a lot of time to digest this experience. I will say that there are some sequences like this one, the worm ride, that is very, very close to the dream. Others are quite different because of the process of the adaptation. It will take me a while to digest them, to make peace with that. <laughs>